It's late. Let's read. This is Three Men in a Boat to Say Nothing of the Dog by Jerome K. Jerome. Um, this book is hysterical, in my opinion. Originally published 1889, so should be out of copyright. Chapter 1. Three Invalids, Sufferings of George and Harris, a victim to 107 fatal maladies, useful prescriptions, cure for liver complaint in children. We agree that we are overworked and need a rest. A week on the rolling deep? George suggests the river. Montmorency lodges an objection. Original motion carried by majority of three to one. There were four of us. George and William Samuel Harris and myself and Montmorency. We were sitting in my room, smoking, and talking about how bad we were. Bad from a medical point of view, I mean, of course. We were all feeling seedy, and we were getting quite nervous about it. Harris said he felt such extraordinary fits of giddiness come over him at times that he hardly knew what he was doing. And then George said that he had fits of giddiness, too, and hardly knew what he was doing. With me, it was my liver that was out of order. I knew it was my liver that was out of order because I had just been reading a patent liver pill circular in which were detailed the various symptoms by which a man could tell when his liver was out of order. I had them all. It is most extraordinary thing, but I never read a patent medicine adver advertisement without impelled to the conclusion that I am suffering from the particular disease therein dealt with in its most virulent form. The diagnosis seems, in every case, to correspond exactly with all the sensations that I have ever felt. <clears throat> I remember going to the British Museum one day to read up the treatment for some slight ailment of which I had a touch. Hay fever, I fancy it was. I got down the book and read all I came to read, and then, in an unthinking moment, I idly turned the leaves and began to indolently study diseases generally. I forget which was the first distemper I plunged into, some fearful, devastating scourge I know, and before I had glanced half down the list of premonitory symptoms, it was borne in upon me that I had fairly got it. I sat for a while, frozen with horror, and then, in the listlessness of despair, I again turned over the pages. I came to typhoid fever, read the symptoms, Discovered that I had typhoid fever. Must have had it for months without knowing it. Wondered what else I had got. Turned up St. Vitus's dance. Found, as I expected, that I had that too. Began to get interested in my case and determined to sift to the bottom. And so started alphabetically. Read up ague and learned that I was sickening for it. And that the acute stage would commence in about another fortnight. Bright's disease, I was relieved to find, I had only in a modified form, and, so far as that was concerned, I might live for years. Cholera I had, with severe complications, and diphtheria I seemed to have been born with. I plodded conscientiously through the 26 letters, and the only malady I could conclude I had not got was housemaid's knee. I felt rather hurt about this at first. It seemed somehow to be a sort of slight. Why hadn't I got housemaid's knee? Why this invidious reservation? After a while, however, less grasping feels prevailed. Excuse me, less grasping feelings prevailed. I reflected that I had every other known malady in the pharmacology, and I grew less selfish and determined to go do without housemaid's knee. Gout, in its most malignant stage, it would appear, had seized me without my being aware of it, and zymosis I had evidently been suffering with from boyhood. There were no more diseases after zymosis, so I concluded that there was nothing else the matter with me. I sat and pondered. I thought what an interesting case I must be from a medical point of view. What an acquisition I should be to a class. Students would have no need to walk the hospitals if they had me. I was a hospital in myself. All they need do would be to walk round me and after that take their diploma. Then I wondered how long I had to live. I tried to examine myself. I felt my pulse. I could not feel I could not at first feel any pulse at all. Then all of a sudden it seemed to start off. I pulled out my watch and timed it. I made it 147 to the minute. 
I tried to feel my heart. I could not feel my heart. It had stopped beating. I have since been induced to come to the opinion that it must have been there all the time and must have been beating, but I cannot account for it. I patted myself all over my front, from what I call my waist up to my head, and I went a bit round each side and a little way up the back, but I could not feel or hear anything. I tried to look at my tongue. I stuck it out as far as ever it would go, and I shut one eye and tried to examine it with the other. I could only see the tip, and the only thing that I could gain from that was to feel more certain than before that I had scarlet fever. I had walked into that reading room a happy, healthy man. I crawled out a decrepit wreck. I went to my medical man. He is an old chum of mine and feels my pulse and looks at my tongue and talks about the weather, all for nothing, when I fancy I'm ill. So I thought I would do him a good turn by going to him now. What a doctor wants, I said, is practice. He shall have me. He will get more practice out of me than out of 1,700 of your ordinary commonplace patients with only one or two diseases each. So I went straight up and saw him, and he said, Well, what's the matter with you? I said, I will not take up your time, dear boy, with telling you what is the matter with me. Life is brief, and you might pass away before I had finished, but I will tell you what is not the matter with me. I have not got housemaid's knee. Why I have not got housemaid's knee, I cannot tell you, but the fact remains that I have not got it. Everything else, however, I have got. And I told him how I came to discover it all. Then he opened me and looked down me and clutched hold of my wrist. And then he hit me over the chest when I wasn't expecting it. A cowardly thing to do, I call it. And immediately afterwards butted me with the side of his head. After that, he sat down and wrote out a prescription and folded it up and gave it me. And I put it in my pocket and went out. I did not open it. I took it to the nearest chemist's and handed it in. The man read it and then handed it back. He said he didn't keep it. I said, you are a chemist? He said, I'm a chemist. If I was a cooperative stores, yeah, you're gonna love this, and family hotel combined, I might be able to oblige you, but being only a chemist hampers me. What was that? I read the prescription. It ran, one pound beef steak with one pint bitter beer every six hours, one 10 mile walk every morning, one bed at 11 sharp every night. And don't stuff your head with things you don't understand. I followed the directions with the happy result, speaking for myself, that my life was preserved and is still going on. In the present instance, going back to the liver pill circular, I had the symptoms beyond all mistake, the chief among them being, quote, a general disinclination to work of any kind. What I suffer in that way, no tongue can tell. From my earliest infancy, I have been a martyr to it. As a, as, a, as a boy, the disease hardly ever left me for a day. They did not know then that it was my liver. Medical science was in a far less advanced state than now, and they used to put it down to laziness. Why, you skulking little devil, you! They would say, get up and do something for your living, can't you? Not knowing, of course, that I was ill. And they didn't give me pills. They gave me clumps on the side of the head. And strange as it may appear, those clumps on the head often cured me for the time being. I have known one clump on the head have more effect upon my liver and make me feel more anxious to go straight away then and there and do what was wanted to be done without further loss of time than a whole box of pills does now. You know, it is often so. Those simple old-fashioned remedies are sometimes more efficacious than all the dispensary stuff. We sat there for half an hour, describing to each other our maladies. I explained to George and William Harris how I felt when I got up in the morning, and William Harris told us how he felt when he went to bed. And George stood on the hearth rug and gave us a clever and powerful piece of acting, illustrative of how he felt in the night. George fancies he is ill, but there's never any anything really the matter with him, you know. At this point, Mrs. Poppets knocked at the door to know if we were ready for supper. We smiled sadly at one another and said we supposed we had better try to swallow a bit. Harris said a little something in one's stomach often kept the disease in check. And Mrs. Poppets brought the tray in and we drew up the table and toyed with a little steak and onions and some rhubarb tart. 
I must have been very weak at the time, because I know, after the first half hour or so, I seemed to take no interest in whatever my food, an unusual thing for me, and I didn't want any cheese. This duty done, we refilled our glasses, lit our pipes, and resumed the discussion upon our state of health. What it was that was actually the matter with us, we none of us could be sure of, but the unanimous opinion was that it, whatever it was, had been brought on by overwork. What we want is rest, said Harris. Rest and a complete change, said George. The overstrain upon my brains has produced a general depression throughout the system. Change of scene and absence of the necessity for thought will restore the mental equilibrium. George has a cousin who is usually described in the charge sheet as a medical student, so that he naturally has a somewhat family physicianary way of putting things. I agreed with George and suggested that we should seek out some retired and old world spot far from the matting crowd and dream away a sunny week among its drowsy lanes, some half-forgotten nook hidden away by the fairies out of reach of the noisy world, some quaint perched eyrie on the cliffs of time from whence the surging waves of the 19th century would sound far off and faint. Harris said he thought it would be humpy. He said he knew the sort of place I meant, where everybody went to bed at 8 o'clock and you couldn't get a referee for love or money and had to walk 10 miles to get your backy. No, said Harris. <clears throat> no, said Harris. If you want rest and change, you can't beat a sea trip. I objected to the sea trip strongly. A sea trip does you good when you are going to have a couple months of it, but for a week, it is wicked. You start on Monday with the idea implanted in your bosom that you are going to enjoy yourself. You wave an airy adieu to the boys on shore, light your biggest pipe and swagger about the deck as it you were Captain Cook, Sir Francis Drake, and Christopher Columbus all rolled into one. On Tuesday, you wish you hadn't come. On Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, you wish you were dead. On Saturday, you are able to swallow a little beef tea and to sit up on deck and answer with a wan, sweet smile when kind-hearted people ask you how you feel now. On Sunday, you begin to walk about again and take solid food. And on Monday morning, as with your, as with your bag and umbrella in your hand, you stand by the gunwale waiting to step ashore, you begin to thoroughly like it. I remember my brother-in-law going for a short sea trip once for the benefit of his health. He took a return berth from London to Liverpool, and when he got to Liverpool, the only thing he was anxious about was to sell that return ticket. It was offered round the town at a tremendous reduction, so I am told, and was eventually sold for 18 pence to a bilious-looking youth who had just been advised by his medical men to go to the seaside and take exercise. Seaside, said my brother-in-law, pressing the ticket affectionately into his hand. Why, you'll have enough to last you a lifetime. And as for exercise, well, you'll get more exercise sitting down on that ship than you would turning somersaults on dry land. He himself, my brother-in-law, came back by train. He said the Northwest Railway was healthy enough for him. Another fellow I knew went for a week's voyage round the coast, and before they started, the steward came to him at, to ask whether he would pay for each meal as he had it, or arrange beforehand for the whole series. The steward recommended the latter course, as it would come so much cheaper. He said they would do him for the whole week at two pounds five. He said for breakfast there would be fish, followed by a grill. Lunch was at one and consisted of four courses. Dinner at six, soup, fish, entree, joint, poultry, salad, sweets, cheese, and dessert. And a light meat supper at ten. My friend thought he would close on the two pound five job, he is a hearty eater, and did so. Lunch came just as they were off sheerness. He didn't feel so hungry as he thought he should, and so contented himself with a bit of boiled beef and some strawberries and cream. He pondered a good deal during the afternoon, and at one time it seemed to him that he had been eating nothing but boiled beef for weeks, and at other times it seemed he must have been living on strawberries and cream for years. Neither the beef nor the strawberries and cream seemed happy, either. Seemed discontented-like. At six, they came and told him dinner was ready. The announcement aroused no enthusiasm within him, but he felt that there was some of that two-pound five to be worked off, and he held on to ropes and things and went down. 
A pleasant odor of onions and hot ham mingled with fried fish and greens greeted him at the bottom of the ladder. And then the steward came up with an oily smile and said, What can I get you, sir? Get me out of this, was the feeble reply. And they ran him up quick and propped him up over to leeward and left him. For the next four days, he lived a simple and blameless life on thin captain's biscuits. I mean that the biscuits were thin, not the captain. And soda water. But towards Saturday, he got uppish and went in for weak tea and dry toast. And on Monday, he was gorging himself on chicken broth. He left the ship on Tuesday, and as it steamed away from the landing stage, he gazed after it regretfully. There she goes, he said. There she goes with two pounds worth of food on board that belongs to me and that I haven't had. He said that if they had given him another day, he thought he could have put it straight. So I set my face against the sea trip, not, as I explained, upon my own account. I was never queer, but I was afraid for George. George said he should be all right and would rather like it, but he would advise Harris and me not to think of it as he felt sure we should both be ill. Harris said that to himself. It was always a mystery how people managed to get sick at sea. Said he thought people must do it on purpose from affectation. Said he had often wished to be, but had never been able. Then he told us an anecdotes of how he had gone across the channel when it was so rough that the passengers had to be tied into their berths, and he and the captain were the only two living souls on board who were not ill. Sometimes it was he and the second mate who were not ill, but it was generally he and one other man. If not he and another man, then it was he by himself. It is a curious fact, but nobody is ever seasick on land. At sea, you come across plenty of people, very bad indeed whole boatloads of them. But I never met a man yet on land who had ever known at all what it was to be seasick. Where the thousands upon thousands of bad sailors that swarm in every ship hide themselves when they are on land is a mystery. If most men were like a fellow I saw in the Yarmouth boat one day, I could account for the seeming enigma easily enough. It was just off South End Pier, I recollect, and he was leaning out through one of the portholes in a very dangerous position. I went up to him to try and save him. Hi, come further in, I said, shaking him by the shoulder. You'll be overboard. Oh, my, I wish I was, was the only answer I could get, and there I had to leave him. Three weeks afterwards, I met him in the coffee room of a Bath hotel, talking about his voyages and explaining, with enthusiasm, how he loved the sea. Good sailor, he replied in answer to a mild young man's envious query. Well, I did feel a little queer once, I confess. I was off Cape Horn. The vessel was wrecked the next morning. I said, weren't you a little shaky by South End Pier one day and wanted to be thrown overboard? South End Pier, he replied with a puzzled expression. Yes, going down to Yarmouth, last Friday three weeks. Oh, uh, uh, yes, he answered, brightening up. I remember now. I did have a headache that afternoon. It was the pickles, you know. They were the most disgraceful pickles I ever tasted in a respectable boat. Did you have any? For myself, I have discovered an excellent preventive against seasickness. In balancing myself, you stand in the center of the deck, and as the ship heaves and pitches, you move your body about so as to keep it always straight. When the front of the ship rises, you lean forward till the deck almost touches your nose. And when its back end gets up, you lean backwards. This is all very well for an hour or two, but you can't balance yourself for a week. George said, let's go up the river. He said we should have fresh air, exercise, and quiet. The constant change of scene would occupy our minds, including what there was of Harris's, and the hard work would give us a good appetite and make us sleep well. Harry said he didn't think George ought to do anything that would have a tendency to make him sleepier than he always was, as it might be dangerous. He said he didn't very well understand how George was going to sleep any more than he did now, seeing that there were only 24 hours in each day, summer and winter alike, but thought if, that if he did sleep any more, he might just as well be dead and so save his board and lodging. Harris said, however, that the river would suit him to a T. I don't know what a tea is, except a sixpenny one, which includes bread and butter and cake ad lib, and is cheap at the price if you hadn't had any dinner. It seems to suit everybody, however, which is greatly to its credit. 
It suited me to a T, too, and Harris and I both said it was a good idea of George's, and we said it in a tone that seemed to somehow imply that we were surprised that George should have come out so sensible. The only one who was not struck with this suggestion was Montmorency. He never did care for the river, did Montmorency. It's all very well for you fellows, he says. You like it, but I don't. There's nothing for me to do. Scenery is not in my line, and I don't smoke. If I see a rat, you won't stop, and if I go to sleep, you get fooling about with a boat and slop me overboard. If you ask me, I call the whole thing bally foolishness. We were three to one, however, and the motion was carried. So that's the start of three men in a boat. Um, I think, spoiler, the title kind of gives it away that probably three men are going to end up in a boat. Uh, I didn't do voices. I probably mispronounced things. I'm sure we all got over that. I know I did. Hope you've enjoyed this.